Boom. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Concord Health Podcast. And today's guest is two-time British champion, Christian Iondokun. How are you doing, big man? What's going on? Not too bad. Thanks, Louis. Thanks for inviting me on the show, sir. It's nice. Nice to be here. Yeah, no, pleasure, man. I'm, I've been tracking your progress for a while. I'm a big, avid, I'm an avid powerlifting fan. Um, you know, I compete myself, not on your level. Um, not on your level yet, and it's um, it's great to see you guys who have, like, you know, I, I mean, not been doing it for 10, 12, 15 years, you know, you've been doing it for a shorter period of time, yeah. and you've got some really good traction already in the game, and I, I've just seen you working your way up, you're grinding away, I've seen you posting your videos, and you're always grinding away in the background, you seem to have a really good attitude and mentality towards the sport and I'm sure that crosses over into your life you know and I mean where does that come from let's start there let's start like your attitude and your application towards towards what you're doing because I think that's a that's a cool thing for me to see yeah for sure um <laughs> well thanks for the uh thanks for the intro um yeah. it's uh I think you've you've hit the nail on the head there because the mentality and the attitude that you bring to whatever you're doing um, in my opinion, defines or or enhances how far you will actually go um, for anyone's given potential. Um, and for me personally, um, when it comes to, to sport, I mean, when I was younger, um, like, n not unlike many other boys, I wanted to become a footballer. Um, in the club. But at the time, um, as, as everybody knows, it's, it's quite a difficult thing to do in the first place. Um, but at the time, personally, um, everyone has their obstacles that is put in front of them um, just by, by life, really, um, and by their environments that they have to get over to, to get where they're, they're supposed to go um, or where they want to go. Um, and a long story short is that um, between the ages of, I don't know, 12 to 16, 17, 18, that's the sort of age where you really find out whether you, you've got what it takes um, to, to make it or not. Um, it's really, it's the mental side um, and the attitude side that I was lacking because from a physical standpoint, um, I was quick, I was powerful, agile. Um, I liked learning, um, liked watching a game, um, all of this stuff. But when it comes down to, when it came down to training, yeah. um, going over and above, um, what your teammates are doing, what your mates are doing. Um, I think that's where I was, I was kind of lacking. Um, and I never really gave it 100%, you know. Um, yeah. it's, it's actually, uh, at the time when I was living in Howard Hill, there was a young John Joe Shelby who used to play for one of the local teams. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, and, good player, uh, good player. Yeah, he is, yeah, exactly. Um, very good player. And... I remember um, I was going to one of his, his dad used to run one of the local, local teams. And uh, he, I think he was playing for Charlton News at the time. Okay. Um, we, were, we were like a, on an evening session. Um, and this is in his spare time whilst we were training. All he did for like the hour, hour and a half of there, we were there, we'd just run, run laps um, just to maintain his fitness. Um, this is outside of what he's doing with his school, outside of what he's doing with his club. Um, and so he actually really embodied what uh, it was that he wanted to become before he was it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think uh, years, years later, um, when I sort of looked back and uh, sort of analysing, doing a sort of self-analyst and self um <clears throat> analyzing myself in terms of how why didn't I do what I wanted to do why didn't I get where I wanted to get um it really didn't come down to only one or two percent of people make it or somebody didn't let you progress or this or that it was just down to you didn't try hard enough um yeah and so that sort of uh instilled then a more resilient uh mindset I would say um Interesting. Is it, is it interesting what you say there, actually? Because do you think, because I know this was a big problem for me. I, I, very similar journey to you. Like my whole life was about becoming a footballer up to probably actually the age of about 18. And I made 
League Two for a season in the conference. But even though I actually gave it, probably looking back at it, almost everything I could, probably could have given it a bit more myself. What frustrated me in the end is actually I got sick of team sports. I got sick of giving it 110% sometimes and then a coach doesn't fancy you or your teammates let you down. And, and, and it used to drive me mad. And that's when I actually transferred over into boxing and, and became a boxer and, and had this, you know, 10 year boxing career. But what, what's interesting is what you say there is you, you're looking back and reflecting and, you know, we'll talk about the rest of your journey after football life in a second, but a lot of people, and we've, we've all seen them, we've all spoken to them, the has-beens, the kind of, the what-ifs, the what-if men, and they're like, you know, used to be a great footballer, but there's always a but, I got injured, and, you know, life took over, and I haven't done anything since then. Well, you know, we're, we're all genetically different, and we're all genetically geared to some sort of sport somewhere, whether we've got fast twitch fibers, slow twitch fibers, or there's something to optimise somewhere, most of us anyway. And rather than just give up at the age of 16 or 17, like you're saying, it's you've, you've actually reflected on, you know, we all grow at different rate, rates mentally and physically, and some of us aren't mature in a younger age to see that we do need to work a bit harder and dig our heels in um, and go through some, some road bumps and roadblocks on the way. But you seem to have taken that mentality, said, right, okay, you know, I maybe wasn't doing that at that stage in my life, but, you know, that's not me, and I'm, I'm, I'm now going to wrap that up um, and harness that into being something even better. You know, had, had you become a footballer of some sort, you wouldn't be what you are now. And it, it sounds like, you know, you've harnessed that really well. So what, where, where did it kind of go, like, after you decided, mm, football's not for me or I'm not, I haven't got there, whatever it was? What, what happened from there? Where did you go from there? Uh, so from, from there, I just, um, I just did the, went down a beating track, to be honest with you. So I went down... Uh, the university route, uh, went to Swansea Uni, um, just played football a little bit there, but nothing sort of, not, not seriously. Um, um, and about 17 is when I started going to the gym. Um, so my last year of college, um, that's when I started going to the gym. And then obviously that carried on um, throughout uni. Um, was it, let, 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 me, let me pause you there for a sec. Was it, so when you first started going to the gym, was it kind of, was it immediate? Did you realise, or did people realise, you think, hey, I'm quite strong compared to other people? Was, was, was that an initial thing? Where did, when did that, when did you realise, actually, I could be good at this? Uh, Whatever lifting weights is at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's a good point. Um, first of all, from, a, from an enjoyment standpoint, I, uh, it, was, it was straight away. Um, I mean, the, the kind of battle that you have with yourself and with a piece of iron, um, which is, is, is quite an arbitrary thing, really, um, if you think about it. Um, it it's, it's not a feeling that you can re easily replicate elsewhere. Mm. Um, but in terms of the, the strength uh, aspect to your question, um, I'd kind of had inklings um, before. I mean, even when I was playing football, um, I'm not the tallest of people. Um, How tall are you? Five seven. Okay. Yeah. Um, still tall. And so <laughs> when I'm sort of <laughs> when, I'm, <laughs> yeah, or, or when I'm when uh, I'm sort of jostling with somebody that's three or four inches taller than me, um, and, and I sort of come out with a ball or come out and attack on things like this, um, I was always one of the strongest um, yeah. guys in in the team. Um, despite my lack of, lack of height. And so I think by the time I was 18, um, or should I say six months into the gym, um, I must have been like between 70 and 75 kilos, somewhere in, in, that, in that region. That's um, quite heavy for that, that height at that age. Well, I mean, I, 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 75 might be a, that might be an exaggeration um, because it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, you're a stacked dude. I mean, that, that's perfectly reasonable, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I, I think more, more about 70s is, is, is a mark um, okay. because I, I just remember that that's actually before uni. Um, I think I'd, within six months, I was doing like 90 kilos for, for six. 
Um, and and I started saying, hang on a sec. And and, and, and the, the is that bench pressing yeah, on a bench press? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was looking around at, at the time at these guys uh, who would have been in their twenties somewhere around that, uh, and they weren't. I never really saw somebody who wasn't gigantic. Um, mm. You, your average male, um, 20s in a gym. I never really saw them doing that. Um, but I didn't, really th- I didn't really think anything of it. Um, so I guess I knew I was strong, but I just didn't know how strong. Yeah, yeah, interesting. That's interesting because it's, it's also at that stage in your life when you start first smashing the gym up, you have different a different mindset normally to the gym. It's like, it's just going, you're trying to get the pump. You just want, you know, you young guy, you're doing it for girls and the pump and the feel good factor. It's not really your whole reason for training is yeah, probably to stay fit and get stronger um, and aesthetic, but you're not thinking like a power lifter. That's a totally different mindset. And the training yeah. is totally different. And again, my journey was really similar to yours. Started weight training about 17, but I thought, you know, I just want to get stronger. I want to get bigger, fitter. I wasn't really kind of thinking about anything specific. It was a standard train five, six days a week, chain, you know, chest day, back day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But I didn't even, I actually didn't even know powerlifting was a thing until I was like, honestly, because, I mean, I probably wasn't focused on, on looking for it. And I was boxing till 28. 27, 28, and into a lot of martial arts. But I think about 29, actually a thing. So it's, it's that weird thing. If you're not training specifically for a strength sport, I also think that really limits your, your strength gains. Um, even, if it, even if you're on the right type of program, it's like a psychological thing. It's there's something about being a powerlifter and hunting those numbers down and being much more, much more kind of focused with your with your way of thinking, that, that that in itself makes you stronger. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think it sounds like we were we had quite similar experiences because I actually didn't, um, in terms of powerlifting proper, um, I didn't come across it until I was 22, okay. uh, 22 23. Um, and, and before that, like you say, the, the how you train is different. Yeah. It was literally anything between six to 12 reps. Um, I would chase the numbers, but not from a one rep max point of view. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I, I always had that sort of, what's the next thing? What's the next uh, weight that I need to hit? How many reps am I going to get uh, a particular weight? Um, that was always there, but like you say, not from a, not from a strength strength perspective that's geared towards getting your one rep max higher yeah 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 yeah. so it is just a different mentality so what um when was your first powerlifting comp what what um i mean where was the flip flipping point we thought you you found out about powerlifting decided to enter what when where, how did that come about okay uh so um after after uni i moved to Cheltenham for work um and I continued playing football just on a uh, just on a sort of ad hoc basis, yeah. uh, just enjoyment really. Um, and I think it must have been somewhere around the region of 2016, 2015, 2016. Um, I just randomly tore tore my groin. Okay. Um, and I think uh, a few months before that, there was a, a guy called John O'Riordan, who was in one of the gyms I used to go to, Simply Gym. Um, and he saw me benching at the time. And at that time, I think my bench must have been around about 130. Oh, wow. Um, okay, nice. Yeah. It was about in the region of 74, 75 kilos. Nice. Um, and he was an M1 lifter at the time. Um, and he was going for Southwest and maybe even national records in, okay. in his class. And he recommended that I compete. Um, and he told me that he'd been to internationals. But um, at that time, I didn't really listen to him. Uh, because for me, um, being an elite level, 
uh, required quite a lot of uh, dedication, um, as I was saying to you early in the show about um, the mentality. Um, and I just thought that I was too far away, to be quite honest with you. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's crazy, right? Yeah. And so, and at the time I wasn't squatting either because of football, actually. Um, I was, <laughs> unfortunately, I was one of those guys, I, I, I didn't want to didn't want to mess up training or, or matches because of it. You know, you can't though, man. If you squat and you're anywhere near any sort of football, that stuff, that stuff messes you up big time. You're finished. You're finished. Like, yeah. even if you don't feel the doms and you've been doing it for a few weeks, you just can't, you can't perform on a football pitch properly. It just finishes yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I, because I, I, I tried it once or twice. And it was almost like, I mean, you can run, you can kick a ball, um, but it's not, it's not the same. You, you haven't got the same quickness. You haven't got the same reaction time. Yeah. Um, you're a little bit more sluggish. Uh, and, and so, um, as I say, when I uh, then tore my groin, um, going, going back to the story, uh, I then thought, OK. So at the time, I didn't actually know how bad it was. Um, in hindsight, um, I wasn't playing for like seven or eight months. Wow. Um, uh, but actually, I could still, I could still squat. So three weeks later, um, after I'd uh, had the injury, I could still squat, and so I started squatting. Um, and I can't remember. This must have been when powerlifting, uh, the world champs, must have been in Belarus or the year before. Um, as I say, sometime in the region of 2015, 16. Um, and I was watching the World Championship, 74 kilo men um, on, on YouTube. Um, I think even just as a, it, it's funny how life is, even just as a recommendation from one of the, one of the YouTube channels, El Elliot Holtz, that I used to watch. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know Elliot, yeah. Um, and I, I saw their numbers and I was like, hang on a sec. Like, some of these guys are only benching 10 kilos more than me. Um, I've got a bit of work to do on the, on the squat and the deadlift, uh, but I'd always, um, unlike the squat, I'd always done my pull-ups, always did my rows. Like my back work was like, I would, I would aim to go as close to doing reps of the full stack. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Some of these commercial gyms. Um, so I thought, actually, uh, maybe I should start working towards this, considering I can't, and I'm probably not really going to, ever get back to where I was in terms of football, uh, in terms of the level of dedication. Yeah. Um, so um, so th that was where it really got started. Um, and, and that was where, as you say, there was a change from the mindset of let's do six reps at, at 90 kilos, 92 and a half kilos, 95 kilos, to actually let's start doing five reps, let's start doing three reps, um, so yeah. on and so forth. Did, did you program yourself at first when you had that mindset shift? Were you looking for programs online or did you just kind of ad hoc it, figure it out yourself? Um, a little bit of both. So um, just as a, as a me thing, I quite like breaking things down and building them back up again. Yeah. Um, and, and because I, I'm quite logical, um, at least in, in the structure of, of how, how I do things or how I see things, um, I quite enjoyed the aspect of you have a six week, eight week, ten week, however long, how long it is, yeah. um, program. Uh, and for me, there was it was quite important to learn the principles behind it, um, not only to just have it work. Uh, and similar to what you were saying about when you were you were playing football and you were relying on your teammates, your coaches, um, in order to be successful because that is part of team sports. Yeah. Um, I'd had that kind of uh, experience as well, although to nowhere near to, to, to your extent. And I thought, actually, I, I think if I really learn this, if I really dedicate myself to it, so I can, I can learn how to, how to program and more what the principles behind it is. And then we'll just, we'll go from there. Yeah, interesting. So you, you kind of, once you made that decision, you dived in, um, it seems. So when, after that, how, so when, where, when, when, when and where was your first competition? So my first competition, I think, was in end of August 2017 in Sheffield. So, I mean, this is why uh, YouTube and Instagram and all of these things are, 
are great sources of content if you can sift through some of the some of the nonsense that you sometimes find um, <laughs> <laughs> so once i decided that that's what i was going to do that's what i was going to pursue it was then about gaining experience because i didn't want to jump in at the deep end so that competition was just a, it was a bench only competition um and it was effectively just to learn um and how competitions are run some of the rules um and so i did make uh, a fool of myself on a bigger stage or a more important competition yeah. and and, uh, and things like this so Do you remember your numbers from that day i think i it must have been 135 um at the time i think so yeah that, that, that sounds right and what are you uh, benching what are you benching now what was your your latest from your last competition my last competition was one 65 Ooh, yeah nice so 30, you put on 30 kilo in what two three years i mean it's, that's that's some big gains for the bench actually yeah yeah i mean it's, it's it's decent i think and that's in spite of a couple of shoulder niggles so so actually that first competition um probably 140 was there but again that that was that competition was not to do with numbers that was to do with getting used to the competition and the the last one I did, uh, last time I competed in Lithuania, um, that 165, again, that was with a shoulder problem. Um, so I think six or seven weeks before that, I benched 175 in the gym oh, wow. um, with, with Henry, the uh, GB coach watching there. Um, so, yeah, I think, that, like you say, that's uh, it doesn't sound like a lot in... in the in absolute terms but actually when you when you put it like that in a, in a few years it's like it's, it's nothing to uh, scoff at yeah i mean it's we're, we're always really hard on ourselves right and and it's hard to because there's no linear progress you get good days bad days good weeks bad weeks good months bad months and um you know powerlifting is a weird sport it's an injury really sets you back really badly it's not like if you're doing MMA or, or something like that, whereas you've harnessed this skill for a long period of time. And, you know, once it's there, it's there. You obviously keep working on it, keep adding new skills, new technique. But if you get an injury, you know, you're, you know, whoever, if John Jones or Conor McGregor get injured, as long as they can get themselves back to full fitness, you know, without any nagging injuries, they're still going to be as, as good as they were before. With powerlifting, if you're out for two or three months, man, it can set, well, it does with me anyway. I'm not a huge retainer of strength. It sets me back like crazy level. And that's the thing people don't realize. So I had, I had COVID and I had yeah. it for a month. I, I was bad. I was ill with it for a month. Wow. And then, like, I, I have never, ever, ever in my whole entire life, and I've had a heart attack. I've never been so sick in my whole entire life. Like, I thought... I actually thought I needed to go to hospital. I thought I was going to die at one point. And when my first session back, after I felt like, okay, it was kind of leaving my body, I couldn't even squat one plate on each side. It was my legs were shaking. Like I, I just, I was completely and utterly gone. Um, holding the bench with just like 50 kilo, I was shaking where it just drained me so bad. And it's taken another seven weeks after the four weeks of illness just to get back to where I was. So it's a weird sport like that. If someone like you, yeah, you know, you have 175 in there and you know that, you get a niggle and that takes you down 10 kilo. Whereas if you're an MMA fighter or a boxer or I'm just using them as examples and you have a niggle, well, you know, if it's a niggle, you can still get through a fight and you can still win a fight and still win your title belt potentially. But when you're powerlifting, it's hard, very hard to like, so you've got a knee problem, then what do you do? <laughs> Not much you can do about it until it gets better. You can train around it or through it, but are you gonna, are you gonna pull off a PB squat? I don't know, I mean, maybe quite unlikely. Yeah, I mean, you, you raise a good point and actually it's, um, it's a timely one with COVID because uh, a lot of people are gonna be in that in that scenario, in that position where they haven't done anything um, that is strenuous or taxing for a while. Mm. Um, and I think 
it's actually probably good that we raise some awareness about it actually that when you go back don't go ham you actually have to take it you've got to take it slow and, and, and in a in a progressive manner yeah be um, patient be patient with yourself mentally i mean giving up is not an option on anything so you know powerlifters are quite committed motivated people for the most part so they're not going to give up but it can be disheartening it can be massively disheartening if you had a bad injury or a bad illness and you just can't, you can't do it. You can't do the numbers. You just have to take your time. I listened to a podcast with Tony Cliff, who is one of my favorite lifters just because, you know, all those years powerlifting and he's never given up and finally won uh, the IPF world. And he said for him, he's just two things. He's been number one, ridiculously consistent. And number two, he's actually never had a bad injury or a major injury. And that's yeah. one real big, you know, roadblock for a lot of lifters. You've got these guys who were on the verge of great things or, or had achieved great things and then got big injuries. And it, you know, it sets you back for a long, long time. And um, that's where your mental game has got to be strong. You need a good support network, good coaches. Um, you know, you, otherwise it can just send you off a cliff psychologically. Even this lockdown, if you can't train properly, I can imagine it's not great for some people and, and you just have to keep strong up in the mind because there is no alternative. There's no point going down a rabbit hole of kind of self-pity, but that is difficult. That is difficult sometimes. Um, yeah. So I've taken us well off the beaten track there. So your, your first comp was a bench only comp. Then when was your first actual proper, you know, full, full competition? Uh, so I think it must have been in November of that year. Um, 2017. Yeah, it must be in 2017, November 2017. So that, there was a regional competition um, in Dover, um, and these are <laughs> these competitions are quite quite far from from Cheltenham. Um, so the Sheffield one was a uh, two hours, and the Dover one was about in the region of four hours. Um, that was a first first full power one um that was the first one i was actually uh was doing a water cut from um because prior to that um i had just weighed weighed in uh, yeah. just walk into the room no problem um and i'd read about this sort of i'd read quite a lot of content before i started competing uh read and watched, listened to, um, whatever term you want to use. Um, and I wanted to test out this practice. And this was in preparation for the British, my first British in 2018. Um, so actually, uh, what actually happened was I ended up bombing at this competition mm. um, because I didn't refuel properly. So the, the actual water cut went, went fine. Um, weighed in 74 on a dot, um, and then obviously you have two hours. Uh, the, the competition itself wasn't that busy, um, so refueling shouldn't have been a problem. But the first time you try these things, you never know what the exact strategy is for you um, and, and how you do that. And I ended up doing it wrong, actually. So, um, so my squat was fine. Um, made all my three attempts. I think I must have finished off with 205 on a day. Okay. Um, obviously, this is only four kilos. And then I opened up on 145, I believe. Okay. Um, and I had done a previous competition um, where I'd finished at 145. Um, just, again, just walking in, no water cuts. Yeah. Um, and I managed to, I, I made the lift but there was some downward movement during it. Um, and it was actually quite a struggle. Um, I, I would have said that was a nine and a half or a 10 on a day to open on. Um, and in training in uh, leading up to the competition, uh, those were, I think I did 145 double touch and go um, relatively simply, um, yeah. no problems. Um, and then my second and third attempts for the bench I, I just couldn't, couldn't press them, really? um, couldn't wait, because um, there's no power. Um, I was, in hindsight, I was dehydrated, um, hadn't eaten enough. Um, mm. Thankfully, they let me 
uh, they let me carry on in the competition. Mm -hmm. I ended up with a 260 deadlift as well. Um, and that competition, I think, taught me a lot of lessons. Um, and in hindsight, that was probably the best, best thing for me when it came to attempt selection, getting ready for a competition, uh, refueling uh, properly, um, and all of this stuff. Um, so then, so that was, it was difficult to take. Um, but my attitude is you, you, each competition, each one of these experiences that you have that perhaps doesn't go the way you want, want it to, there's a lesson to be learned that makes you a better person, a better lifter. Um, and you shouldn't leave that on the table um, in favour of just, just sulking or, or, you know, like, like you said earlier, giving up. Yeah. Um, because actually you're harming your progress in the future. Uh, and there's something to be learned from every, if you want to call them failures, there's something to be learned from every kind of bat or experience that doesn't go the way you want it to go. Let's put it that way. And there is, there, you know, failure is a big word. It's a strange word, but you know, you wouldn't want the experience to go that way, but it had, it had, and there's something to be learned from it. And you know, now you're two time British champ. I mean, how, how does that feel? Was it, well, like, how did it feel after the first one? Were you like really over the moon or was it kind of like, okay, cool, I set out to achieve that. Let's crack on. Um, I was a little bit of both, to be honest. So obviously um, I bonded my first full power and then it took me, so just before the British, I'd actually competed at the last competition, which I could use as a qualifier. Um, so that was, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was worried, but it was a little bit of a close call. Um, I'm from a numbers perspective. I think the qualifying total was 500, um, and so uh, as long as I didn't make any silly mistakes, I would have qualified for nationals. And then um, at nationals itself, I think I was, I was not. I think I was an unknown quantity. Then um, I hadn't been there before. I think James Duff uh, had been quite. Maybe dominant is the word um, in that category. James, James, James can push, pull, pull up some big numbers. He's got big squat and stuff, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he has a, he, he had a, and still has quite a big squat. And he's one of these people that you, like you said, he's, he's almost a, a veteran of, of the sport um, yeah. in, in this country and in that weight class. Uh, and he actually didn't have his, uh, a great day at the time. Yeah. Um, I think he must have missed a squat. Um, and I had a I had a mishap as well um, myself again with 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 the water cut um, and refueling <laughs> as if I didn't learn my lesson. <laughs> the, the, um, so I ended up taking um, ridiculous jumps really uh, at the time. Um, I remember if I remember rightly, correct me if I'm wrong. I remember you walking out for your first squat, and I think it was 180 or 185. No knee sleeves. Yeah, one no belt. Yeah, no knee sleeves. No belt. And you just walked up to the bar and it was like, it was just like a gym squat almost. It was like, right, let me just get this one out of the way. Now, I, I, even the commentators were like, oh man, really? It's like, you were just strong enough to do it by a mile. But it, it was just like walking up to the bar in a gym. You obviously had warmed up and stuff, but it was like the way you were wearing no knee sleeves. And I don't even know if you had a belt on. It was just like, um, oh, I just quickly do this one. Just get this one done. It's so funny watching that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, it, and then you jumped to like, what was it, two something, two oh five, two ten. Two ten. That's a big jump. Yeah. Um, so it, it, again, this is like, it was some of these things that I'd uh, that were part of my strategy. It wasn't part of my strategy to open at one eighty. It was actually part of my strategy to open at two ten. Um, one eighty was actually uh, my final warm up. But the issue is um, because I'd I'd practiced. Uh, um, had some experience with a walk up before. I actually, on the day, didn't know what was there. So I had no idea of what I was capable of. Um, and because of the experience on the bench press, because on that day, um, that I explained to you, I felt okay. Um, but when it got to the platform, um, I wasn't able to, to, to lift properly um, in terms of the combination of power strength and obviously the technical aspect to it that, that, that a good lift requires so my attitude was 
uh, just go out there, just get the lift done. <laughs> Doesn't matter how, how messy it looks. Yeah. Um, and see how you feel in terms of the weight on your back. Did, and, are are uh, you quite, do you get, I don't know how to word this quite, but because of the weight cut or the water cut, I don't know if you're a particularly anxious or nervous lifter anyway, but did it, does that make you more, did it, I suppose, not now, but did it make you more nervous because you're not just sure where you're at with the water cut? Um, naturally, uh, it did make me nervous, but not to, not to an extent that um, would have affected my performance because that 180, um, it was a weight that I knew that I could do whatever the weather. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't a question of whether or not I could do 180. It was a question of whether, whether or not it was a question of whether or not it would be easy or hard. Fine, fine. And 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 it's that that would have determined my next attempt. And thankfully for me, <laughs> on the day it turned out to be easy. So I, so I made that that jump. Yeah. Um, I was okay too. So then I made another 17 and a half kilo jump, um, but only because. Um, James and Luke Rogers missed one of their one of their squats each. Yeah. So I thought I can put a little bit on here without being ridiculous because had everything went to plan, I was aiming for 240. Yeah. Um, but uh, I thought that that was probably a, a decent number um, considering the day and considering the fact that the other two um, had missed a squat each as well. Yeah. So, so you, you had a, you know, you had a good performance on the squat. Your bench went well. I think you've done all three benches, right? And yeah. then you, you're, you're a big deadlifter. You're a massive deadlifter. Um, and you went for, you went 275, which went up nicely. And then I think you went British record 290 at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So opened on 257, then 275 for a second attempt, and then 290. Uh, 290 the went up. And I thought... I need to watch that back maybe, but I thought at the time, I can't remember, but I thought you were unlucky not to get that. You, that went up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I complete the lift, but uh, there was a little bit of hitching um, and the refs called me on soft knees as well. Um, I think it's one of those things where if it was a divisional, um, it probably, I probably would have got it. Yeah. Um, but because it's a national and because you're going for a, a record, there's a there's probably the the natural tendency to to be a little, be a little bit more strict on the rules, which is absolutely fair enough. Um, yeah. I mean, there's no <laughs> there's no sort of ill feeling there. Um, it's it's a tough and, one. It's it's going to happen to the it happens to the best of lifters, to be honest. And listen, you got the W that day anyway. Unfortunately, it didn't affect you. It didn't drop you um, to second or third place or anything. And you beat some stiff competition, which is great. To beat James and Luke, um, Alexander Espin, I think, on the day. Yeah. Um, he's probably a bit more of a, um, an accomplished 74 now. He's another big, huge deadlifter as well, actually. Um, it, you know, you beat some good competition, so you can't... It's great to, to know that you were there at that time against some of the best in the country, and, and you beat them. Um, was, uh, did Chris Wong, did he, was he on that one? No, I think that was one he, um, I think his, his baby must have been born then. Okay. So uh, he didn't, he, he, he wasn't there. And that was a good lift though. He's, he's, he's one of my, he's, um, he's, I like, I like the way he's way left him. Always looks very calm actually. Um, so never yeah. good lifter. Okay. But, um, so you, you won at the 74s, British champ, amazing achievement to be a national champion. Was it a decision immediately to say, do you know what, the weight cut's getting too hard. Let me go to 83s now for the next year. Uh, no, I, I, I was actually felt that there were, um, there were things that I could improve upon. Um, and obviously because at that time I hadn't had a competition which everything had gone to plan. And obviously some of that is just life. Um, but from my perspective, I have a sort of, if you prepare for certain things, it's almost like a, a, a formula type um, approach, um, which people need to be careful with because no matter how well you plan, there's always going to be some things that you can't plan for that happen on the day. Um, but regard, irrespective of that, I, I thought that there were probably some things that I, there were enough things that I could have improved upon um, 
to stay in that weight class and still do well. Yeah, um, yeah and, and, and at this point, I think you have to remember, I, I didn't know how long or where the powerlifting journey <laughs> would take me at the time. I wasn't thinking uh, five, ten years. Um, I was thinking two, three years, uh, which changes sort of your approach to um, how you train in the competitions and your weight class ultimately, because obviously the longer term approach that you have, um, you've got to really factor some sort of growth in there. Um, so, so yeah, I think I, I then did uh, my, my first Euros after that. And that Walcott was okay. What was um, that? that? That was a 74 again? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah So was, yeah. That, was that your first time you competed for GB? Yes. Well, it would have been, wouldn't it? Yeah, after the British. So how was that? I mean, that, that's, that's a, that should be a big moment for anyone. You get the call, you get the letter. Competing for Team GB is frigging... I mean, I, I done it as a boxer. And I tell you, man, like I was... It's weird because I was emotional. I, like, you know, I'm really passionate in that way. Um, so how was that for you getting that, you getting that call up? Yeah, man. Um, to, to be honest with you, you've, you've hit the nail on the head because uh, usually I'm just all process, 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 performance, performance, performance on the day itself. Um, but on that day, like I remember putting the singlet on um, after I'd weighed in. Um, I thought, wow, man, this is like, this is surreal. Like, cool. you know, it's, it's, up until that point, I'd always heard of guys and girls talking about representing their country, and, and it sounds kind of cheesy. Um, <laughs> but at, at that time, when, when you actually think about what it means, um, in terms of, regardless of what the sport is, um, the fact that you've, you've beat yourself um, enough to get to that position, you've beat everybody else, um, and you're now there, and you're expected to perform on behalf of a country competing against other countries yeah. um, I, it was just it was very very surreal um, alongside the fact that at that level the how the competition was was run um, or are run it is similar to a professional sport they've got like you've got replays you've got the lights you've got all the uh, um, the spotters uh, I mean, everything is just, it's just set up. And I just said to myself, wow, you just, you don't know whether you're going to be here again and you've got to just enjoy the whole experience. Um, and I, I loved it. Yeah, that's cool. I think anybody who says that it was kind of, you know, I was still just in the zone and, you know, process, process, process and didn't have any little bit of emotion There's something wrong with them. There's, you know, to, to, to get that call up to compete for your country means so many things um, for somebody that's been there personally. So it means a lot of things to the person that's achieved it. And it's a really big testament to their, um, to, to a lot of, um, a lot of parts of their character and their commitment and all sorts. But it also means a lot um, just from a, a team and a cohesion and a, a historical perspective as well. You look at all the great athletes in the Olympics over the years and we look back at them as, you know, he heroes to the country, no matter what gender, race, creed, colour, whatever someone is, it's just an amazing thing to be able to um, be training in a particular country, live in that particular country and then be good enough in yourself to then have the platform to go and showcase yourself in front of everyone. And you do, you've done that on merit. You, anyone, anyone's done that on complete merit. Um, a spectator, no matter what sport it is, like, you know, in the Olympics can sit back and go, everyone here, for the most part, unless they're, you know, unless they're using some pharmaceutical intervention, but let's, let's say on the most part, they're there, they're there by merit and hard work and dedication and yeah we see so for example if you know i'm watching the world or the euros or whatever and i see your nine lifts yeah we see your nine lifts and you might win a medal or gold on the day hopefully and you're like oh how amazing but actually no that's 
it's not that day. It's what you've done in the years before that. And it's that, that's the value, the value that you put in yeah. for the four, five, six, 10, 12 years, whatever, before that mentally and physically, you're now showing your value in that two hours on the stage or whatever it might be. And, you know, it just, it, it should mean a lot to, to everyone. And it's, and it's great, man. It's like, it's so pleasing to see guys like you who graft in a way to, to get the rewards there as well. And um, going, to, going to the Euros, it's frigging cool as well. It's a really cool thing. Some stiff competition in the Euros. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think um, it's definitely true as in, and, and I think that's what a lot of people can, can relate to, especially with, with a sport like powerlifting. Um, because I think I, there aren't many sports where you can be in such close proximity in terms of being able to see, being able to, to talk to um, people that are performing at a high level and you have just, um, and maybe you've just started the sport yeah. in, in a gym. Um, so perhaps you, you could be training in the same gym as Owen Hubbard um, yeah. or you could be training in the same gym as Joy um, yeah. or, or and so on and so forth. Um, and I think we can all appreciate what you just said about when you step on that platform, it's not just about the minute that you have to do your lift. It's about everything that you sacrificed so that you can get there and then uh, put, put a good performance in. Um, and, and I think that, that that plays, that's, well, it's just like you said, that's, that's the real value. Um, it it well, is the value. I mean, it's like when someone says, oh, that Rolex cost 10 grand. It's a weird analogy, but it's true that Rolex costs 10 grand. But I'm saying, well, you're paying for the two years or, uh, you know, I heard it takes two years or 18 months or something silly to build a Rolex. You're paying for that, that value of that time and that care and that input. And, and it's the same with a sport. You know, you, there's, there's very rarely, very, very rarely any kind of sportsman that's made it to the top level purely on just talent. I mean, look at Cristiano Ronaldo massively talented but that guy's work ethic is just like an absolutely ridiculous level as well at the same time he turned himself into a specimen so like again like you just said it's um it's accumulation of all the things you've done that have took you right. in and it's important to not be too i guess you know i haven't been there as a power lifter but not to be too emotional especially on the day but to acknowledge it is good i think definitely especially the first time probably um sort of get used to it and, and get and start sucking up the big stage. But um, the first time, it's definitely a cool thing. Did you, so you, you've done the 74s at the Euros. Um, how did you get on? Where did you place there? I ended up placing, I, I got the same total as the guy who was in sixth and I finished seventh on lot number. On, on okay. So, and and uh, then, so then it was after that you went up to 83s, you done... British yeah. at 83? Yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. So, uh, did you find a big that. difference? Is that, did, did you feel different within yourself being an 83 kilo lifter? Uh, I definitely felt bigger um, and my bench definitely uh, went up in a short space of time as a result. Um, it, it definitely felt better because I could, I could eat a lot, um, a, a lot more anyway. Um, I was better fueled for uh, for training sessions, but I think I actually must have lost a little bit uh, of an edge um, because when I was competing at 74, in order for me to compete at 74, I had to be bang on with uh, with the way I was fueling um, and, uh, and my food and that. And so even though there was less available uh, for me to utilise in, in order to compete at 74, I had to be like... 80 plus percent efficient with that. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's no secret that in terms of powerlifting, um, people aren't as stringent with their, with their diets <laughs> yeah, as yeah. they maybe should be. Um, but uh, definitely in terms of uh, long term, longer term progress, um, it was definitely the right thing to do. Yeah. So that, that's a great achievement um, to come first in the 74s and 83s and back to back years. Um, and also, I want to say, like, pretty unusual. I mean, that's to step up 
like, I mean, someone, I, I don't know if anyone else has done that before, have they? Back to back years, a champion in back to back years at two different weight classes as a Brit in the British. I mean, I'm not sure that's even been done. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, it's definitely on common. On common. Um, I mean, maybe... they're, they're, they're both quite stacked divisions as well. The 83s is, there's some good lifters at 83s as well. I mean, Owen didn't compete that year, did he? No, not. Oh, no, he did. didn't. No. So who, who else is in that division? Is it, um, who else is in, in the, the 83s? You have Durin's is, is, is not. Yeah. Um, he was, it was him and Owen for a number of years. Um, obviously, Owen wasn't there. Um, and then the 74s. The 74s, I think, was a little bit more more stacked than now, well, in the last couple of years. Is, than, is, Pierre, is Pierre Schillingford an 83 lifter? Or a... No, he's, he's 93s. The, the, the 93s is the one that's really, uh, that's, that, that's pretty stacked. I mean, you've got Pierre, you've got Ashley. Yeah. Uh, you've got Eric. Actually, you've got... Listen, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, so... that, that, that's another stat class. But, I mean, r regardless to win back-to-back -back in two years like that is, um, you know, don't take that lightly. That's a testament to yourself and, and again, your hard work. It's, um, it, it's very cool. Now, I want to talk about the Euros. So, you had a... I would say from the outside, you had a good Euros. You might feel differently. Coming forth is... It's a great achievement. I'm sure you would absolutely love to place. But you're, you went for a world record deadlift, right? Yeah. I mean, was that a decision on the day? That was a massive deadlift. And my girlfriend's a powerlifter. Um, and we were watching it. We were streaming it live. And, you know, we, we're big into it. And we, we, you know, we really cheer on all the Brits. We've got our favourite lifters, our favourite kind of national lifters as well. But we, when, it kept, when you came out for the world record, we were like, Come on, man! Come on, let, let's 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 do this. Let's do this. And that was um, that went up. That went up, and it was oh god! You could see it was it was there. And you, I mean, what happened? You just lost your balance, or it just overshot it slightly. What do you think? I think it's probably a co a culmination of uh, quite a, quite a few things. Um, so what obviously, was it? sorry, what weight was it again? It was three. Three three one, I think, okay. um, or three thirty and a half. Okay. Either either, either one of those, because then the um, Cheeto, the Norwegian guy, um, attempted. Uh, it must have been three three, okay. three three zero. Um, but I think the first thing that was that it was actually quite heavy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a little bit obvious um, to say. Um, but for you to do an RPE 10, uh, absolute maximal lift, yeah. uh, your technique, well, there can't be any fault in your, in your technique. Um, so I think it was actually quite heavy. That's the first thing. Um, but also I think I, I may have let the weight get to me a little bit. Um, so I, I probably savored the moment a little bit more than I should have. Wow. Um, Interesting. In terms of not treating it, so obviously you have your everyone has their their normal setup, um, but I think that you should you should set up the same way, exactly the same way, with the same mentality. Whether it's ninety kilos or one hundred and eighty, two hundred and seventy, whatever the weight is on on the bar, um, and I'm not sure that I could have, in hindsight, made the lift, but. I think that there was definitely a chance. Um, I also think that my just general fatigue on the day um, didn't help matters whatsoever. You, um, did you travel and have lack of sleep and you like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually made quite a big uh, hash, um, and that and that's that's an understatement um, of in my preparation. Um, so long story short, I had to get a, a new passport same day. Um, oh, man. <laughs> Christian, come on, man. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I had to uh, rearrange my travel arrangements. Um, I ended up flying out on that day um, in the morning. Oh. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not even rookie. It's, it's beyond rookie. 
Um, and, and then obviously just get there and prepare. Um, so, I, I, so, yeah. That has to affect you in some way, surely. Yeah, and I and I subconscious. Yeah, I think the, the 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 reason why we went for that is because that would have actually got me a placing. Um, my previous attempt, three seventeen, um, I I definitely could have deadlifted three at least three twenty five on a day. Yeah. Um, but uh, we we went for three that number because it would have got got me third and alongside Owen in first. That would have been a great result for for GB and me personally. Um, I would not have asked Henry or or accepted that attempt if I didn't think that there was a chance that I'd I'd make it. Um, and I think three weeks before I did a triple at three hundred, um, and it must have been at most an eight and a half RPE, um, which was which indicated to me that I would have been had I been fresh and no mishaps i would have been in the 330 region anyway um, i mean i mean it's still an amazing attempt and uh, listen let's hope it's there at some point let's hope it, it's um i mean that that you had some good competition above you in those places i mean owen's bench is just a joke it's absolutely ridiculous um yeah, it is. i mean it's just i've got bench envy honestly um him and Brett Gibbs just tossing that world record around between each other. And it's just, <laughs> uh, it is crazy. And, you know, when someone's got a huge bench like that, it's one of those funny lifts, isn't it, the bench? If you're, like, quite far ahead on the bench, it really gives you a big chance elsewhere. Um, but to be, you know, I'm sure fourth is, I don't know what you had in mind before, probably not where you wanted to finish. It's still a great achievement and, and you're only going to build on that for next time um really is that what's um you know talking about that what's your goals where, where do you see yourself in kind of 18 months to five years as a powerlifter any anything you set yourself let's say any little targets any little goals you set yourself that you want to say on the air you might want to keep some to yourself i get that <laughs> um yeah so it's, it's a good question because uh up until recently it's just been go 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 the next competition um the, the next thing um i think henry and jason a couple of the coaches i think they said they expected me to almost take a year out from being not take a year out but take a year to adjust to the to the weight class which okay. would have been obviously that i wouldn't have gone to any internationals um for for a period of year um but going Going forward now, with everything that's happened, I think for me personally, it's the first thing is to get back to to, to where I was um, because, I, as I said to you, the last competition, um, I'd actually been struggling with a a shoulder issue um, in my AC joint um, that has been one of those one of those injuries where it's not that painful, but it doesn't allow you to. To, to train very hard unless you just back off. Um, so um, the first thing is to, is to get healthy um, because then I think I I could have potentially um, a good shot at challenging Owen, um, not just sort of being behind him um, or being close to him. Um, and, and, you know, just having quite a, quite a close competition because I think that will automatically push me and push the others as well. Um, and in terms of a total, I, I think honestly, I, I don't really want to say this on air, but um, if I'm healthy and if I can, as you say, like, just like Tony said, uh, if I can build a period of consistency, uh, then there's no reason why I shouldn't start looking at an 800 total, really. Mate, um, you said it. You said it on air. So you've affirmed <laughs> it now. You've affirmed it. That's that's good, man. You believe it. You believe it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, why not? I I, I think that if you can ded dedicate enough time to it, and if you can see where your where some of your weaknesses are, um, like like just to to, to break it down a, a little bit. Um, 
just before lockdown, um, squatted 272. Um, un, that, that was unpeaked as well. Um, and that was because I, I, I knew there wasn't any competitions <laughs> that were likely to go ahead. Um, the gyms are going to be closing. Um, and, I, and, and as I say, uh, the 175 is there um, and the free fight should be there. So, so really, um, in terms of when I'm talk, talking about increasing, I need to be sort of looking at incrementally like a, a 280, maybe a 180, uh, 330 sort of region. Um, and it's, it's difficult to... You, you need to be careful with just sort of putting numbers out there because what, you, what people need to understand is that behind each one of those numbers, there's a, a series of things that you have to do um, to, to make it work. It's not just that number. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so uh, it comes down to if you can make all the constituent parts work, and then you just, you just keep making progress um, and, and don't get injured. Um, so Man, Honestly, you, you've got great attitude towards that. And I, I got faith that you can do it. And I think you know you can do it and it's um let, let's let's um let's hope that you have a, a new, nice good injury free run because i'd love to see you do it and um that that would be an amazing thing um to to hit that total for sure and, and i'm sure you'll change your goalpost once you get there again because <laughs> that's that's just what we're all like right um, yeah it's a, the game it, it is it is a game it's the game everything's a game the life is a game and um that, this is all part of the game what um Couple of other things I want to touch on. Diet. What's um what's your diet like? Any any do you have a nutritionist? Do you do it yourself? Uh yeah, so this is this is another thing I, I do myself. I think that uh beyond a certain point, I think you're you're going to get most of the benefits from just being sensible. Um I think I don't think the powerlifting necessitates like a a gram by gram approach like bodybuilding or, or like another, another super uh, carb heavy sport, sport like football or rugby. Um, but I think that in terms of fueling each session um, and in terms of changing your body composition, those are probably the, the, the main things for powerlifters. Yeah. So uh, I think listen to quite a lot of material on, on this. Um, and done a few courses just about just in general on sports nutrition and 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 really the the goal is to eat enough protein to recover um, and then uh, eat, eat sort of a moderate amount of fats um, and then the rest obviously is is going to come from carbohydrates to, to to fuel your workouts um, aid recovery as well uh, and then you stay hydrated so um, I'm being quite general. Um, but I think that uh, it's probably what is required for powerlifting. I don't think that people should be eating pizza and, and, and donuts and, no. and all of these things because it just doesn't help your body composition. Um, and, and I think it doesn't help anything, man. That stuff makes you feel like shit. I mean, if you if you smash pizzas and cheesecakes and, and crisps and that's just not good for your health. And that that you know when when something isn't good for your health, that's you might get a short-term performance um, gain, but you, that's definitely not long-term. Your joints are going to start hurting. And you're you're going to get mental fatigue and all sorts of issues. I mean, I know like Eddie, the way Eddie Hall was eating when he was going up to the world's strongest man and um, the one that he won and um, the 500 kilo deadlift. Like if he kept it, by, this is by his own admission, if he kept eating like that, he would have died. He would, he, you know, you die. You can't just keep eating like that. And I know that's extreme, but for me, if I eat anywhere along those lines, I mean, like, I just have different issues. Like, I'm just fatigued. I'm tired. I don't even have the motivation to, to train. And I don't struggle with motivation. But it, what you say is, it is exactly, exactly right. You know, it's pizza and stuff. It isn't going to help your body composition. But there's also that other side of things. It doesn't help as well. Yeah, I think uh, so you, you raise an important point there about like the short term versus long term. So with regards to performance, um, I don't, it probably has very little, if at all, any difference on performance. And I think that's why a lot of people get, get into this trap of it doesn't matter. 
because on a day to day, like you having a pizza, I don't know, or like three donuts before you work out, like in two or three hours, you may not see that it has any effect because you are able to do your work. Yeah. Um, you're supposed to do that individual workout, but it's really when you like put everything together um, that it begins to have effect. Well, like you say, and the same with me, it begins to have an effect on, for me, how sluggish I was, uh, I feel. Uh, on on any given day and then my body composition and also for me the more sugary carbohydrates um, that I have um, the more I feel like having and so it just it means that I miss my macros on a daily basis or I miss my targets on a daily basis which means then I miss it on a weekly basis and then before you know it you're a couple of kilos heavier than than you need to be um, or your body composition is not as you want it to be, and, and that definitely, um, the stronger you get, each bit of lean mass is is just it's like gold dust, <laughs> really, because that's 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 where you get the force from. So um, it's it's it's, it's, in, it, it's important in a indirect way, and more so in the long term, um, and just for your general health, really. Yeah. No, you made some good points there, and um, you, um, I think everyone that's listening or it's going to listen to this, should take, take real note of that. It's, um, you know, number one is you have to eat differently for different sports or for different activities that you're doing. Um, you know, you're not, if you're a powerlifter, you're not eating like a bodybuilder. You're not trying to be a bodybuilder. It's a different thing altogether. And I've seen, I've seen a comp- the last competition I've done, man, like some of the stuff people were eating, I- I'm quite methodical. Um, you know, I am a nutritionist myself and I'm really into nutrition and where it comes from and how you digest it and how it's optimized. And I don't really put any crap in my body. It doesn't, for me, that instant taste and that instant dopamine hit or, or serotonin hit I get from eating bad food, it doesn't outweigh how bad I will feel an hour or, or the next, an hour later or the next day. When I've done my last comp, I'm a 74 kilo lifter and I think 12, maybe 12 competitors weighed in. I can't remember. And about number one, about seven of them miss weight, which is just ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Seven of them miss weight and had to go up a weight division and wait till wow. the latest slot. And the ones that didn't in that weight class and the ones I see around it were just smashing ridiculous like food, like crisps and, chocolate bars and i think i know what you're doing i see what you're doing you know you're trying to i don't know if they're thinking about it that methodically like they're loading up on sodium and sugar and just high calorie foods but actually you know there's much better ways to do that and much healthier ways to do that and get your performance in because if if that were me you know i'm quite sensitive food wise i would start crashing halfway through the competition and i just I just wouldn't feel great, to be honest. When I started doing that, once I put a belt on, I feel like I'm going to throw up on the judge, to be honest. And um, I think there's something to be learned for every lifter there. Actually, you know, it might work for you, like we said, in the shorter term, but it, all these things are 5%. You know, your mental state, your sleep, your food, your stretching, your recovery, your sauna work, your, whatever you, if you can do that, your massages, you might not think they're big things, but all those things, you know, might add up to a total of 20% and keep you consistent. And, and you have to do all of those things. And, you know, I wish more athletes and, and lifters would, would take that into account because, you know, we'd, you, you'd have a lot, we'd have more good lifters or better lifters. And, you know, we really want to see everyone doing well and optimizing themselves. And we are, I, we only want to try and beat people when they're at their best because it pushes us to be our best. You know, I'm not yeah. interested in beating a guy who's had a bad day with an injury and bombed and I come first. So what, what does that mean? And that, you, you know, I want to try and beat the best on their best day. And, you know, I'm sure you're the same. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, there's a, there's another thing to be learned from that because your performance is made up of several different factors. Um, and just like you said, even for an individual, you don't know how how each factor will affect your performance. Some people are okay on six hours of sleep. 
Some people are going to need eight. Some people need to stretch for half an hour. Some people need to stretch for five minutes. All of these things um, come into your performance on the day. And, and, and I think it's people usually do it because A, they can, they can get away with it. But really, um, if performance is, is what you want, um, you should be looking for, like you said, that extra one, two, three, four, five percent yeah. that, that you can add. And just because you get away with it, that's that's not where your analysis should stop. Just because you got the numbers you wanted to, could you have got more? Um, what happens if instead of you have you having chocolate bars and, and donuts, you had some bananas or some like a, a dextrose drink yeah. or um, decent carbohydrates, uh, and you fuel properly? All of this stuff, and, and it, it is minor, um, and, and I think that's what sometimes uh, we have to remember, and, and that some people are not in it for the absolute performance. They just want to get on a platform and be okay. But from a performance standpoint, certainly I think um, people's game day strategy could be <laughs> yeah. could be quite a lot better. It could be better. It's much better thought out, and. Um... You know, hopefully that evolves over time. And, you know, the ones that take it upon themselves, then then great. Um, the ones that don't, then, you know, you're never really going to know. You're never going to know if you're missing out slightly. And that's that's important. Yeah. Um, that You don't want to ever leave this game or leave any game and think, could I have done a bit more? Like, yeah. could, could, did I leave something on the platform? Could I have done a bit more? Um, so we're going to wrap it up in five minutes. It's been a really good chat, actually. I've really enjoyed it. And... A couple of things. Coaching. Do you do any coaching? Yeah, I do. So um, I think this is probably one of the things I missed out on when you asked me about goals. Um, and one of the things that, one of the reasons why I started uh, the journey alone, uh, if, if, if you like, to, to get a feel for what, or um, trying to find words, um, to get a feel for, what everything, what the whole process entailed. Um, I think over time, um, I'll need someone to uh, to, um, to do my programming or coaching in, in the traditional sense um, so that I can help um, and start to do some coaching of my own. I mean, I've, I've done some already. I've been doing some for, for the last year, um, but it's just, it's been light touch. Um, because it's you're you're responsible for someone else's progress um, at, at the end of the day, um, not wholly responsible because really personal responsibility <laughs> should be where it's at. But yeah, you're yeah. you're involved in someone else's progress, and, and and I think that that's not something that personally I want to take take lightly. Yeah. Um, and so, so I've, like I said, I've had a a few clients over the last year and. Um, have done the the GB coaching course and hopefully when they start up um, I'll do the level two um, and just can continue learning from lifters that are better than me um, coaches that are that, that are better than me um, there's there's plenty of content um, if you can find it from from decent sources as well uh, so yeah good good man so um, if someone wants to find you uh, for coaching or for whatever, is it where's the best place? Your Instagram. So yeah, Instagram's the best base, uh, best place to find me at Christian the Coach. Um, I'll put just, that. I'll put that in the the show notes as well. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So that's 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 it. I'm always willing to have a conversation. Um, okay. And yeah, see see what we can do. Awesome. I hope uh, I want people to get in touch because um, you're now you know a world class lifter, and to get that ad advice off a world class lifter is there's there's value off advice from most people but to get it off a world-class lifter who's had to compete at you know the, at, at an international stage you, you have a lot of nuggets to give there so before we round up one question um you have a favorite lifter anyone in particular that you look up to or you like past or present could be anyone favorite lifter um I don't think so. Um, I, I think that, that there are a couple of people that, that, that I look up to um, and, and it's more in terms of replicating what they've done. So obviously on a, on a national level, um, I mean, Owen has been a, 
uh, quite a big source of inspiration uh, or motivation rather for me in terms of um, setting a level um, that, that people want to want to be aiming for um, and then yeah so I, I actually think yeah I, I'll, I'll stick with Owen um, because I think he's he's had his fair share of uh, um, how would you say successes and also some some performances where he's had to just grind through and work through he's had to work through injuries and, and things like that so he's yeah. almost like a younger Tony Cliff if, if you will yeah so I would like actually I'd like to get Owen on the show um as it goes. Um he was um definitely gonna be an interesting guy to talk to and again uh, another great lifter. It's um I think it's always good to have someone not that maybe that you do look up to or someone that motivates you maybe and um you know you're not in necessarily in awe of because as an athlete you wanna be that guy. Um yeah, you can't so say again. Yeah, you can't be in awe of anyone. Yeah, not in awe is not a good word, but um, to take some motivation, whether you, what way you're using that can be, you know, used differently. Whether it's like you, you're hunting the guy down, or you just give him a little, you know, that little wink of acknowledgement. You know, that that guy's a good lifter. Like for me, it's um, it's Taylor, Taylor Atwood. It's just that guy's mentality on the platform. It's, it's, it's incredible. Oh, crazy! He's got crazy numbers. His, his attitude and his mentality on the platform is is crazy as well, and it's um, you know, you'd never sit there in awe, but you you just look and go, yeah, like fair play, fair play. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, the the American guys, they are very very attractive to uh, to to look at because some of their numbers are just they make you question what they're actually doing over there. I mean, I I I I, I don't know how they're they're treating the the, the sport, um, but it's funny their their numbers are so good that I kind of I almost it means that I I don't look at them as as a as a source of motivation, and it's that sounds a bit sort of counterintuitive, but it's because the the sport itself is in a different place, whereas somebody like Owen like. I know what the what the crack is in GBPF. Um, I know what what we're working in, what what the system's like. Um, whereas you, you know what boundaries you have, and yeah. what things people are doing and not doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, for, for all the reasons that you said and and more, like Taylor Atwood is just. <laughs> he, I mean, his his thing. At world seven ninety at seventy four kilos. That's so mad! It's so mad! It's, it's so mad! I mean, <laughs> there, there's there's lifters in the untested federations. They're getting nowhere near that. Like yeah, world exactly. class lifters. And I think exactly. Jesus, man! Like what? And he's got no weaknesses either. It's like yeah. it just doesn't. I mean, I mean the seventy four Michael C A. Um, Austin Perkins, yeah, and then you're like, man. I mean, I, I have sat back and watched the Royal Nationals before, and I think I worked it out right. I think Luke Rogers' total from last year, I think, was six eight five, and I, and I'm going to be off on the numbers here, but I think that would have only got him about fifteenth or sixteenth place in the yeah. American Royal Nationals. I thought, really? Yeah. I mean, really, it's that big a disparity between Britain and America? Well, well, this is this is why I say that I, I find it difficult to use those guys as motivation because their sport is in a different place. Yeah. Um, I think my best, my total work British would have got me like eighth place um, in, in in the USA Nationals, yeah. and so the conditions are so different. I don't want to compare. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and that's why. But in terms of from a from a, an achievement perspective, um, and from an admiration perspective, like. All of their classes are stacked. They're so competitive. It's like a professional sport. I mean, it might as well be. Um, and it's just, it's amazing to watch because it gives us as a, as a, as a sport and as a body over here, something to, something to aim for. Yeah, especially the production, the production that they put on and the, um, the kind of, they always do everything bigger than us anyway. But yeah, it's important. You know, we only want this sport to grow, the fan base to grow, the production to grow, the platforms that we're competing on to have more fans, to be more jazzy, to be 
better and it's just better for us and it's better for the spectators. And hopefully, um, you know, over time, the sport is growing. Social media has been good for the sport for the most part. And um, hopefully we'll, um, we'll get there, man. But I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, and, it's, you know, it's great to have you on. I'd love to do it again. We'll do it maybe after you've, um, you've competed again. So you've got some, we've got something to, to kind of go through and dissect and how you've done in over a period of time. But um, anything you want to leave at before, before I, we, we turn off? Uh, not really. Just um, obviously thanks for having me on. Um, definitely come back. Um, and for those people watching, I mean, most of us are either out of the gym or at least at the very least don't have our usual gym environment. It's just like we, we said earlier in a show, just to remember to, to be careful when, when we all go back eventually, because like you say, we want the sport to grow. Um, and that includes people not getting injured because I haven't been to the gym in a few months. So Definitely, man. Suck it up, guys. Suck that advice up because it's great advice. And Christian, uh, pleasure having you on. Have a good evening and um, I'll see you soon. Cheers, Louis. Take, Take care, care, guys. Daddy.